We're recording. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mike. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all uh, this well morning, my time, afternoon for most of you, I think. Um, so I'm going to give a short and very broad overview about um, modeling and some of the reasons we do it. Let me just skip to the next slide already. So really, in this brief overview, I just want to say two things. Uh, the first thing is one of the reasons why we typically do, or some of the reasons why we typically do air quality modeling. And then uh, the second part, I'll just sort of briefly talk about compare and contrast the different model types. So you'll hear in more detail about the different kinds of models uh, through the rest of this uh, webinar. This is just kind of a to, to lay the landscape and compare and contrast. So um, I like to think of air quality management this way. Um, so we have emissions data, we have ambient measurements and monitoring of concentrations, we have air quality models, and you know we do lots of science, but hopefully at the end of the day, all of this is informative to decision makers who are trying to make decisions, reduce emissions, protect people's health, and so on. So, um, as a modeler, uh, you will see that the air quality model is kind of in the middle of this diagram. So that's maybe a little bit self-serving. Um, I wanna emphasize, of course, all the, the pieces of the system are important. We can't do anything without emissions and concentration data really well. I put the air quality model in the middle, not because I think it's more important than any of the other pieces, but because it's kind of the the space where a lot of the information comes together and can talk to each other. So talking about reasons that we do air quality modeling, um, probably uh, this is uh, familiar to most people, but when we talk about air quality models, we're talking about models that take basically two kinds of information. They take the emissions data down here into the model. The model does a bunch of physics and chemistry. And then the model output is predicting pollutant concentrations like PM 2.5. Um, the model, of course, also needs meteorological data, uh, which is an important part of the input. So one of the uh, major reasons that we do air quality modeling is, and I think that a lot of people here in the audience are people who do a lot of measurements, uh, so we measure these concentrations. We see con uh, certain levels of PM 2.5 in the areas where we live and work. And uh, a major reason to do air quality modeling is to explain the concentrations that we see and to see if we can understand how they come about. Um, the second major reason for doing air quality model, um, the model is nice that it lets you do what if scenarios. And so you can imagine different worlds where emissions are either higher or lower, see what the concentrations would be and see what the health impacts would be. So the two kinds of what if scenarios are uh, some sort of policy implementation that reduces emissions. And then we wanna think about how are the concentrations lower and what are the health benefits? Um, and then kind of more specifically, sometimes uh, they get used in evaluating or permitting a new source, maybe a, a industrial facility that wants to operate and people want to understand better how the neighborhoods around uh, are being impacted. Let me talk a little bit about explaining observed uh, concentration. So of course, this is basically just a check that we know uh, what's going on. So it's a consistency check in the sense that the emissions that we estimate are they sufficient to explain the amount of pollution that we observe or are things missing something? Is there something that's overestimated or underestimated? If you think about the input data uh, and also the models themselves, models can fail to reproduce observed concentrations for lots of reasons. Emissions, meteorology, uh, that maybe the chemistry is not well represented, um, but at the risk of overgeneralizing, uh, the emissions are often uh, the biggest limiting factor uh, and the biggest culprit that explains uh, poor predictions. And those are often the focus of the evaluation, and they're often the thing that we're really interested in, is really understanding whether we know what's happening and being emitted in our region. I put down a couple caveats here. 
where I've maybe overgeneralized about emissions being the biggest culprit, but in the interest of time, I'm going to keep going. Um, in terms of evaluating the model predictions against observations, I just listed a few things. There's lots of ways that you can uh, think about doing this. Uh, most obviously are the average concentrations over or underestimated. Um, but oftentimes it's very informative to look at some specific details. So are the spatial patterns well predicted? Are you getting gradients or the highs and the lows in the right places? Are the temporal patterns well predicted? Uh, you know, traffic emissions you typically see at certain times of day, and that's an important clue about what's going on in the model. And then the last two are about species, either gas phase or the speciated composition of PM 2.5, uh, which is also uh, uh, an important clue. And at the risk of going a little bit to the side, I mean, I know that uh, low cost sensors, uh, there's a lot of uh, work going on and they're definitely game changers and groundbreaking. They're really great, especially for the numbers one through three, the first three things here. Uh, a limitation of course, is the last couple. Uh, you typically don't get speciated PM 2.5. That's always been important for evaluating um, whether we have the right sources. And so that's something that I just want to throw out as a question that we all need to kind of work on. Okay, so that's a little bit about why we model. Uh, I didn't say so much about the policy evaluation part because that's maybe more straightforward. You have to estimate how the emissions change and then run the model again. So now I'm just going to mention the different kinds of models that you're going to hear about today. So um, maybe the first one is chemical transport models or CTMs. Uh, they divide the atmosphere into a three-dimensional grid of boxes. The equations in the model are mass balance equations where for each box you, you track the, the mass or the concentration of pollutants as it increases or decreases by these processes here, emissions, chemistry, deposition, transport that you see kind of drawn as a kind of a cartoon diagram in each box. And in a typical chemical transport model, this is one box, but it's connected to tens or hundreds of thousands of other boxes. Chemical transport models are really the state of the art, most rigorous, most flexible. Uh, they can use be used for almost any kind of purpose. The major disadvantage is that they are also the most intensive in terms of resources. We'll hear more about that. Um, you'll also hear about GCMs, uh, which people either call uh, global climate models or general circulation models. GCMs and CTMs, uh, and I'll under GCMs, I'll also include regional climate models, are mostly very similar. The major difference is in a chemical transport model, the meteorological uh, data are input. They, they're in some sort of input file. And then the CTM does the air pollution only. Meteorological fields affect the atmospheric chemistry, of course, but not the other way around. The chemistry doesn't affect the meteorology because it's pre-calculated. In a climate model, the model is predicting both the meteorology and climate and the atmospheric chemistry. And so they can interact with each other. So the particulate matter can reflect sunlight change clouds and so on. So that's important for certain kinds of studies. Generally, um, for a lot of purposes, you can use either one. All right, we will also hear about dispersion models today using AirMod as an example. Um, this is just kind of a picture. Usually the dispersion models use some sort of Gaussian functional form to track um, a source of pollution from a, from a specific location. There's different kinds of equations. There are Gaussian plume equations if you're doing steady state or puff if you're using time dependent, but they basically describe how the pollution spreads from a source using um, a Gaussian functional form. Uh, in comparison to chemical transport models, they tend to have very limited chemistry usually. Usually, whereas a chemical transport model is really applied comprehensively to a whole region, uh, dispersion models are usually focusing on one specific sources and how it impacts the vicinity. That makes them a lot simpler than chemical transport models and GCMs. 
The last thing we'll hear about is reduced complexity models, which are really a whole different beast. Um, there's much less uh, emphasis on the chemistry and physics. So for policy and decision-making, as we move into that space away from the scientific applications, um, it really becomes more important to have something that's easy to use and very low barriers to entry for a decision maker to evaluate options quickly. Um, and so I'll talk more about that later. I'm not going to say too much more. A benefit is that it often computes the health impacts directly so that additional step is incorporated. And I think that's the last slide indeed. So I'll turn it back over to Mike and look forward to talking more about reduced complexity models in a second, in a little bit. Thanks. Great, thanks, Peter. Uh, so I think Dan is, is next up. Dan, whenever you wanna go ahead and start. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go full screen. Are you seeing uh, the full screen? Yep. All right. So yeah, you're gonna hear from me twice. Uh, first on dispersion models, which is something that Peter just mentioned. Uh, and then you'll hear me later on GCMs, which also Peter mentioned. Uh, but part one, we'll start with uh, dispersion models. Um, for those that uh, don't know me, I'm Dan Westervelt, uh, Associate Research Professor. My main appointment is at uh, Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University, um, but I have a lot of other appointments that you can see here. Um, I think many of you probably know me from the uh, the sensors world, um, but also I, I think uh, I've done a lot of uh, modeling as well in my in my career. In fact, I, I was a student of the previous speaker, Peter Adams. Uh, who basically taught me the, the modeling that I uh, know at this point. Um, so yeah, we'll start off with with AirMod. So what is AirMod? Um, uh, so I, yeah, the, the acronym is a little bit unclear, but the best as I can tell, it's uh, the American Meteorological Society Environmental Protection Agency Regulatory Model. Um, and so that it's a it's a free service provided by um, the U.S. government, basically the the EPA and the American Meteorological Society. Um, I have the link here uh, that can tell you everything you need to know about it, uh, but it is basically a, a dispersion model. Um, it can be run on you know, a typical laptop. It doesn't require a whole lot of computational power, at least in its basic form. Um, it does require some, some knowledge of you know, a command prompt if you use Windows or terminal if you use uh, Apple. Um, there's tons of online guides and tutorials available at this link. So uh, we can, um, you know, you can look at the recording or we can put this link in the chat a little bit later. Um, one downside is that uh, it doesn't come with sort of graphical features by default. Um, you know, I'll, sh I'll show you an example of what the output looks like in a little bit, but um, if you want it to look like this nice picture right here on the right that I have, um, usually there's some external software that's available. It's not, it's not free. Um, you know, this this is a screenshot from AirMod View, which is you know some proprietary software that takes the code from AirMod and takes the output and then plots it up nicely in this graphical user interface. It allows you to change um, you know some features and look at different things and zoom in and etc. Um, so that version, you know, is, is comes with a bit of a cost. Um, but uh, in theory, anyone can run the air mod itself. Um, so yeah, as, also, as Peter mentioned, it, it uses uh, mostly Gaussian uh, dispersion modeling. Um, so, you know, this, this equation up here is, um, you know, might look a little intimidating at first, but um, this is basically, you know, describing the concentration at any point in time, uh, sorry, at any location, 3D location, X, Y, and Z. So X, Y, and Z being your, your 3D spatial coordinates kind of shown here in this plot. Um, you know, this, this, this equation will basically give you the, uh, the concentration at, at that point. All right. And so it's a function of uh, the emissions rate 
which is Q. So if you if you basically say that, okay, you have a single point source right here, which is this sort of cylindrical thing, uh, and then it's kind of spreading out down downwind, um, you know, this is the use case for this particular type of model, all right? So it's mostly best used for uh, the situation where you have kind of a point source and you're interested in knowing what are the direct impacts from that source, um, you know, within maybe 50 kilometers of that source. All right, so um, you have to know kind of the emission rate of, of your source. Um, you have to know kind of the height at which it's emitted. Um, so what's like, we call it the stack height, basically. So if it's, you know, a power plant emitting um, boiler or something like that, that has the stack, um, you would say, okay, the, the stack height is H. Uh, it depends on the wind speed. Um, so that's what this U variable is here is the wind speed. And then it also depends a bit on uh, what we call um, dispersion parameters, which are the sigma y and sigma z. So these dispersion coefficients or dispersion parameters, this is where um, the meteorology comes into play. Okay, so these dispersion coefficients are based on atmospheric stability. Um, and atmospheric stability is, you know, the idea of uh, is the air kind of uh, stagnant or is the air, you know, uh, mixing rapidly um, because of course if the air is pretty stagnant and there's not a lot of motion of air then you're going to have buildup of pollution and higher concentration so you can see why um, that you know concept plays a big role in determining concentrations all right so um, you know it's this this equation you know includes some emissions some some wind speed some dispersion um, parameters and um, and it takes sort of this exponential sort of Gaussian looking form, which is why it's, you know, sometimes called a Gaussian plume model or a Gaussian dispersion model. So that's that's kind of the guts of how um, it works. You know, it's there's there's a lot of different forms of this this equation here. So depending on what you assume about uh, dry deposition and depending on what you assume about, um, yeah, different uh, assumptions about the the spatial coordinates this there can be changes to the this equation but it's kind of um this is sort of the guts of what's happening so um what do you use air dispersion models for like like the air mod um so you know what they are basically is is uh mathematical formulations that characterize atmospheric processes that disper disperse disperse uh, a pollutant emitted by source as i mentioned it uh includes emissions and meteorological input um, and then it can sort of predict concentrations at selected downwind receptor sites. So um, by receptor site, I basically mean, you know, some X, Y, Z coordinate here. So if you wanted to know, you know, in this domain, some X, Y, Z point, what's the concentration? That would be sort of your receptor site. All right. So you have your sources, then you have the dispersion model, and then you have the receptors. Um, and I did I did emphasize on on point sources earlier, but this actually can be there's versions of these models that can be applied for non point sources as well. Um, you know the dis as I mentioned the dispersion is is sort of in, included in sort of the the wind speed and the stability conditions, um, and the receptors are typically uh, fair, fairly close to the source. You know this example has ten kilometers, but um, you know, you, it's, you, you need to be, I think, within about 50 kilometers in most, in, in most air mod cases. Um, so air mod is a, uh, what we would call a Lagrangian model. Um, there's two types of uh, frames of references here are models. Um, there's the Eulerian model, which is uh, kind of this fixed domain in space. It's the, it's the CTM that, that Peter was talking about. And then there's a Lagrangian mo model, which is what air mod and what dis most dispersion models are, uh, in which the domain boundaries um, basically follow the, the mean airflow. So the boundaries are sort of changing as um, you have um, wind dispersing pollutants and, and things like that. So this figure is kind of uh, a example here. So a, a Eulerian or Eulerian is, you know, somebody sort of observing this airflow uh, with pollutants and having a fixed spatial coordinate and the Lagrangian is sort of the frame of reference is the person is in 
within the airflow, observing directly and, and changing its coordinates uh, in real time. So what are some uh, <clears throat> advantages and disadvantages of, of AirMod? Um, you know, or I guess this could be applied to any dispersion model. Um, so I have sort of a, a side by side air mod versus CTM here. Um, C, the CTM particular one called CAMX. Um, yeah, so air mod just being sort of a, a Gaussian, a pretty simple equation as I, as I mentioned earlier. Um, whereas CAMX is uh, a three dimensional, um, you know, it's I think Peter discussed it a little bit, and, and I believe Matthias is going to talk about CTMs a, little, a bit more. Um, Mostly, there's not a whole lot of chemistry going on in the uh, air mod. Uh, extremely little, you know, non-reactive plume. So this is a really big shortcoming uh, of these type of models because we we all know that um, atmospheric chemistry is important and it affects the concentrations of things. Um, you know, this is a limitation that means basically you can mostly use these things for you know primary pollutants that you know you're not too worried about uh undergoing any physical or chemical changes um i mentioned the distance already uh whereas you know ctms have a much bigger spatial coverage um you, you know ctms also don't give you sort of this need to uh, look at specific receptor points um but air mod has kind of this advantage of being or, or dispersion models in general of being you know very simple to use um you know, quick operation doesn't require a lot of computing power, whereas a, as a, a CTM, you know, is is thousands of lines of code and and, and can be pretty difficult. Um, I think I'm running out of time, so let me speed up here a little bit. Um, this is just sort of a overview of the AirMod system. Um, so AirMod itself, you know, kind of does the emissions dispersion and uh, concentration prediction, but it requires a bunch of input data to make that happen. As you can imagine, it requires a lot of uh, meteorological data. It requires terrain data. Um, you know, there's a, a module within the air mod system that accounts for buildings in the area. So we have buildings, um, you know, in the way of the of the plume that can cause, you know, uh, interesting things to, to change with concentrations. Um, and then <clears throat> if you, you know, if you want to look at what the input and output is like, so this is basically, you know, if you're using just the, the free version, um, you know, you could see on the left here in the black and the white is the sort of the inputs that you need. You have the emission rates, stack heights, um, temperature, exit velocity. Um, you have building data I mentioned. So are there any buildings in the way? Uh, terrain data, uh, meteorological data. So you should have wind speed down here at some point. And I see that that's one of the... Uh, uh, categories, you have the height at which the wind speed is measured. Um, yeah, so that gives you sort of a flavor. And then the output, you know, here is shown on the right. Um, and this is basically telling you, you know, what are the concentrations at a given uh, X, Y, and Z point? All right, so you have an, the receptors here, the concentrations in of this, in this case, it's SO2 and micrograms per meter cubed um, at, you know, these given points, these X, Y, and Z coordinates. So that's, um, Really, all I was going to say about AirMod, uh, again, I put this website up here because you can get tutorials, um, you can run sample code. It really walks you through everything you need to do with uh, the free AirMod version. So I'll stop there and pass it back to Mike. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dan. Uh, okay, so we started with an intro, uh, and then we kind of started with the somewhat uh, easiest um, model that, or sort of the, the least uh, complex model, <laughs> star uh, asterisk that we're having. Uh, and now we're gonna step it up uh, and go a little bit more complex. Uh, and so this will be Matthias Beekman talking uh, about Chimere uh, and CTM. So go ahead, uh, Matthias. And if you wanna do uh, GCMs. Okay. okay, yeah, let's do that. Like, okay, great. All right. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. Give me okay. a second. Um... So I can. All right, Mike, there should I go. just should I just go? We're good. 
Yeah. Go. All right. All right. So uh, we'll go right into part two for me, which was uh, uh, GCMs, general circulation models. Um, I'm going to talk about also uh, call them climate models. Uh, you might also hear me say earth system models. The names are evolving, I would say, over time. Um, but this is a schematic for, you know, a, a different type of model. Um, this is actually going to be kind of similar to, to how CTMs do it. Um, but you have basically the atmosphere split up into a bunch of discrete boxes of a certain length and width and height. Um, and so you have the, the horizontal dimensions, latitude and longitude. Uh, and then you have the vertical grid being, you know, height or usually atmospheric pressure. And then with, within each of these different boxes, you have um, equations that basically uh, solve for the amount of uh, moisture in the air, that solve for the amount of pollutants in the air, in the case of you know, air quality, um, solve for the, the temperatures and the precipitation, and, um, and basically do all of these processes in, a, uh, in an individual box and then sort of repeat that for all the different boxes around the globe. And of course, the different boxes also have to talk to each other uh, because you have transport from one box to another by the wind. Uh, and so it's a it's kind of a big, um, you know, complicated uh, set of, of codes, but um, this is sort of the, the basics of how it works. Um, so I'm gonna uh, show this visualization actually really quick, which I think is, um, it's a visualization of one year of a uh, climate model that also includes a lot of atmospheric chemistry. All right. So the different uh, colors that you're going to see over the continents represent different types of pollution. Um, so the sort of the green pollution that you're seeing is going to be uh, carbonaceous aerosol from biomass burning or from biofuel burning um you know cooking that kind of thing the orange stuff you see is uh dust um so you can see a bunch of it at the sahara desert in the middle east um <clears throat> the stuff you see over the oceans that's blue that's going to be uh sea spray and then the um kind of the white stuff that you're seeing over for example uh east asia and uh you know europe and part eastern united states that that's um you know energy related pollution so from power plants and whatnot so i'll just go ahead and hit play on this um so this is output from a climate model uh you can see uh the days kind of going by as you see this sort of um dark and light uh shading go across the screen you can also see all the pollution you know moving around um you know, if you look at sort of the the ocean, you'll start to see a lot of interesting fluid mechanics going on. You'll see some rotation. You'll see some, um, you know, maybe even you might even see a, a hurricane forming, a tropical cyclone. Um, you know, just to kind of give you an example of what all is happening. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll stop it there. But that's sort of. Um, gives you an idea of what you know these things can do um and they can obviously do a lot more than just generate these nice uh graphics so we'll we'll get into that now um so yeah a climate model um it is basically a computer model of the entire earth system so when these when these things started they they didn't necessarily couple the entire earth system you might have had an atmospheric only model and an ocean only model and a land model and an ice model uh, but nowadays, um, these things are mostly integrated into giant uh, Earth system models, as, as we sometimes call them. Um, so it's a computer model, uh, three, dimen three spatial dimensions plus time, uh, hundreds of thousands to millions of lines of code, depending on, um, depending on what model you're using, um, run on you know, high-performance computing clusters or supercomputers. Uh, this is a picture over here of the NASA Discover um, high performance computing cluster, which runs uh, several uh, NASA climate models, I would say. Um, 
Yeah, and so you know the planet is is split up into these boxes, or sometimes we'll call them grid cells, as I'm as you saw in the picture. Uh, conservation equations are applied to each box to track movement of winds, heat, gases, particles, clouds, etc. Um, <clears throat> the box size or the resolution has has greatly improved over time. Uh, so you know, to, if you're doing a global model, um, you know you you're going to have to repeat all these calculations for every little box you have. And so that becomes very computationally expensive. Um, but, you know, as computers have gotten more powerful, we've been able to reduce that box size. Um, you know, some of the highest resolution models are, are run at, you know, about a quarter degree. Um, it, it, it's still a little bit scientifically cumbersome or computationally cumbersome to, run at that high of a resolution and also do, you know, thousands of years of climate projections uh, with multiple ensemble members and all that. So I would say that, you know, maybe the the current uh, working resolution is somewhere between one degree and, and two degrees of spatial resolution. It's it, it varies a bit. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And so, uh, you know, on that point, you know, long simulations, if, if you want to use this for climate studies, or even if you want to use it for prediction of air pollution in Africa in 50 years from now. Um, you know, if you're going to simulate 50 years, you can imagine that, you know, that can take a lot of time. And in fact, it takes weeks of real time for uh, even on these type of supercomputers to perform those kind of simulations. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so there's a, just a huge number of calculations. So if you assume, uh, you know, about a two and a half degree box, that's about 10,000 cells. Um, and then if you say 30 layers in the vertical, so that's 10,000 horizontal cells, you know, multiply that times 30 for the vertical, you're saying about 300,000 grid boxes. Uh, we have about seven unknowns. So that's, you know, 2.1 million variables. Uh, if you assume 20 calculations, which is would be a low estimate for each variable, uh, you have about 42 million calculations per time step. Uh, if you have a time step as you simulate of 30 minutes, which would be pretty reasonable, uh, 2 billion calculations per day of simulation. And if you want to simulate for 100 years, if you want to say what's the air quality or what's the climate going to be at the end of the century, uh, then that's 73 trillion calculations. So you can start to see how these are uh, meeting you know, the, the, the fastest computers that, that currently exist. <clears throat> so the physical underpinnings of the climate models um, are based on first principles. So going all the way back to even Newton's laws, um, you know, Newton's laws of, of uh, force and motion. Um, so, you know, we have sort of equations for the east, west, and north, south wind direction. So the horizontal and, um, you know, kind of, yeah, north, south, east, west, x and y. Um, that are you know conservation of momentum question uh, uh, um, based basically on conservation of momentum. Uh, you also have a you know a vertical balance equation um, that is a lot simpler because we assume that there's no acceleration in the vertical direction. So um, you know uh, constant velocity basically um, that you know for f equals m a if you assume uh, you know no acceleration. Um, and you sort of have a uh, constant velocity uh, of going back to basic physics. Uh, we have conservation of mass um, to, you know, uh, incorporate into this as well. Um, conservation of energy from the first law of thermodynamics. Uh, and then the ideal gas law is also a uh, important variable uh, equation that's used in, in these models. So there's about... Um, in this in this schematic I've given you, there's six equations for six unknowns. Um, all, oftentimes, moisture is is the seventh equation, so you have a conservation of moisture as well, and uh, you know that that goes into and just makes it you know even more complicated. So um, yeah, so you know it's based on some conservation laws, you know Navier-Stokes equations, um, Newton's second law as it applies to fluids, first law of thermodynamics, those kind of things. So these are these are deterministic models. They're based on, you know, well-known physics um, at, at their core, which makes them, uh, you know, quite powerful and, and maybe, you know, more powerful than, for example, just statistical models, which 
don't give you sort of the same physical understanding. Um, <clears throat> sometimes they're called general circulation models because they solve for the general circulation of Earth. All right, so I don't have time to get into what is the general circulation in detail, but um, it basically describes, you know, what are the prevailing winds? What is the prevailing motion of air and heat and mass uh, that goes on throughout throughout Earth? Um, and, you know, you have the, the model that we use kind of has, you know, a couple of different cells, as we call them, um, polar cell, mid-latitude cell, and Hadley cell. Uh, and these result in different flows of air that sort of, um, you know, predominate at any given point, uh, depending on kind of where you are on the planet. So we call this the general circulation. Um, a brief kind of history here. So the, the field of, of computer modeling is, is relatively new. Um, it started at, at Princeton University, at least climate modeling started at Princeton University uh, in the 1950s. And a guy by the name of Suki, Suki Manabe from Japan re recently, a couple of years ago, won the Nobel Prize, I think it was in physics, um, for, for developing climate models. Um, and, you know, when they were, when they were very early on, they were very simple because computers were not quite to where we needed them. Um, and if you look at sort of the history, things started out very simple. You know, you would just be happy to, in the early days of climate modeling, be able to simulate some rain. Um, and nowadays, you know, we have, as I mentioned earlier, we have integration of all the different aspects of the Earth system. So the ocean, the land, the ice, the air, um, all of those things kind of have merged together where we are today. If you look at this right plot, plot on the right, um, you see all these kind of individual things, you know, atmospheric chemistry is the one that's most relevant for us because that's the air quality side. But there's all these other modules that can come together and affect each other. You know, so the atmospheric chemistry can be affected by um, vegetation. It can be affected by transport. Um, it can be affected by sea, uh, sorry, air-sea interaction. So you need to have the, the ocean model coupled in there. Um, yeah, and then we have sort of types of, of climate models. So the, the general circulation model, as I mentioned um, a few times now, it, it integrates, you know, the equations of fluid motion. Um, it has things called what we call parameterizations. Um, and these are things that happen on, on very small scales or it's physics that we don't quite understand. Um, so for example, if you have convection and you have sort of formation of, of uh, cloud droplets from condensing moist warm air as it rises, um, these are processes that uh, you know happen on very, very small scales. You know, the, size of a cloud droplet is, you know, a mic is in the, on the order of micrometers, maybe a hundred micrometers or 50 micrometers or something like that. Uh, and so obviously these are much smaller processes than the grid sizes. You know, I was telling you the grid sizes are maybe one degree latitude longitude, which translates to about a hundred kilometers. Um, so we have to do things that can um, allow that type of science to happen on a small scale. And that's basically called parameterizations. Um, we have the, the coupled climate models, again, the Earth system models I mentioned, those are um, the ones that incorporate sort of everything together. Um, so what can we use the GCMs or the ESMs for? Um, I'd say, you know, this is a list. It's not a, it's not a, a complete exhaustive list. There's probably other things here that you can use these models for, but just to give you an idea, um, you know, experiments that can't be performed on actual Earth. So, you know, to give you an air quality relevant example, if emissions of pollutants from some region of the world decrease, uh, what impact does that have on air quality? What impact does that have on, you know, extreme temperatures, extreme precipitation? Um, you know, basically what does that sort of do? Um, you can also have what are called detection and attribution studies. And you can say, you know, is some anomaly statistically significant and can it be explained by just natural variability versus human factors. All right, and so this plot on the right is an example of that. Um, it's the temperature over the 1900s. Um, so the temperatures in Fahrenheit, sorry about that. Um, we have the observed 
temperatures from the 1900s to 2000 in the black. Um, and then we have the model using both natural and human forces in the pink, and you can see it matches along very well. And then in the blue, we have the model simulation where we've artificially removed the human influences, and that's in blue. And you can see it doesn't match very well. And so you would say, okay, this is, you know, we're attribu attributing this um, change in temperature to an increase in human activity. Um, it can also be used for future projection. So based on you know, socioeconomic underpinnings of future emissions estimates, what will climate or air quality be in the near and far future? You know, what is what is the amount of sea level rise going to be in 2100? What is the uh, PM 2.5 concentrations going to be over West Africa in 50 years? You know, these are all things you can you can get. Um, you know, testing to see our, our physical understanding of a process is, is correct and accurate. Uh, and we can also... Uh, use it to estimate something called the climate sensitivity, which is how much warming do you get for a given change in emissions. Um, the final thing I'll talk about is how do we know these models are accurate? So, you know, all models are wrong, basically, uh, but some models are useful, is a, is a famous saying in this field. Um, because we are making assumptions and we are uh, representing things that, you know, may not be 100% accurate at times. Um, so the idea is not to get that 100% accuracy. It's just to, you know, characterize and evaluate the model and see if it can at least be useful. Um, and so this is just a collection of random uh, uh, model evaluation exercises. And in this upper left scatter plot here is a is an air, air, air quality relevant one. It's the uh, modeled sulfate concentration um, versus the observed at various locations around the world. And you can see, um, you know, you get a pretty good agreement here on the one-to-one -one line, although there's definitely, you know, some deviation, you know, you get sort of a, a pretty high correlation coefficient. Um, you can look at, you know, similar things. This is uh, this is precipitation here on the bottom left. Uh, so this is, you know, three climate models in red, green, and, and blue and then observations of precipitation in black, and it's spread out by latitude, and that was the precipitation rate. So you can see, you know, the models generally following the um, the black, which is the observed pretty well, but, you know, there's some places where they don't do very well. You can see this huge difference here. This is called the double ITZZ problem, which I'm not gonna get into, but uh, right around, you know, minus 10, minus five latitude, you have, uh, the precipitation in the model is way overestimating what the actual precipitation is. Um, so I think with that, um, I'll stop and turn it back over to Mike for the next uh, set of slides. I'm happy to take questions at the end. Thank you. All right, great. Uh, so I will present for, for Matthias and just let me know when you wanna switch slides to be able to Take it away. Okay, you got the slides then? Yeah, okay, great. So sorry, sorry again for that. So um, I will talk then, I will go one step back in complexity with respect to the climate or climate chemistry model even that uh, Daniel presented and I'll talk about chemistry transport modeling. Next slide, please. So, um, I think, yeah, Daniel talked about uh, already about these boxes. So, so this is, uh, you, you imagine a, a volume of, uh, of air and this is, so the basic, the basic thing that we have, uh, in, in, in this modeling. Um, so you have this box of air and, um, which is, and you have, uh, some boundaries of it so uh, and you can transport air and chemical species across these boundaries by advection or by diff diffusion turbulence by deposition and emission also at the boundary from at the ground and you have inside this box you have chemical um, processes going on which can deplete some species or create some other chemical species and then all these processes can be described in one equation, which is a mass conservation equation, which gives you the evolution 
and the time change of concentration of different species within the box and which describe all the fluxes related to the pro processes I was, I've was i been just talking about. And this gives you what is called a differential equation of so the time evolution of these species concentration in these boxes. So next slide, please. And then simply, if you put these boxes together on a grid, then you, you get a 3D model. Um, if it's a fixed grid in space, this is a... This is then a Norelin model, and this is so. This is the the special setup then of a chemistry transport model. Next slide. Um, in this is now really different from this chemistry transport model. Uh, sorry, from the climate model, who which who are let's say self sufficient more in a sense and which both calculate meteorology and chemistry. Here in this chemistry transport model, meteorology is an input that we need and that we get from meteorological, meteorological models. Other inputs already mentioned are emissions, also land use, also the boundary conditions. If we have a, a limited area model, which does not cover the whole globe, then we need, um, we need to know the concentrations of chemical species um, at the at the boundaries of the at the physical boundaries or frontiers of that model. So in blue here, these are the four types of input input data that you need. Then inside the model we have a, this transport scheme, which translates the meteor meteorological data in in amount of species transported one box to the other, the chemical chemical scheme, and also a deposition model. And I talked about. Um, these differential equations for each box, you have one differential equation for one species. So at the end, this gives you a lot of differential equations, which you need all to, to save all together numerically. And this is a numerical solver, which is doing that. And the, what you get then is then uh, 3D maps of species in space and in time. The informatic languages that you use for that are um, are Fortran and shell scripts in particular. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so the history of the development of the Shimer model is then, um, is then uh, we, we started doing that 25 years ago with, by simply starting with a box model. So we, where we have several boxes over the Paris area. This is the figure on the, light, on the left side. Then we refined that in, in having these Eulerian grids over the European domain. We very quickly used the model for operational pollution forecasts. Um, then we added anthropogenic aerosols, dust. We, we introduced parallel um calculation that needs that you have you can use supercomputers with several a lot of a large amount of pros uh, of uh, processors or cores that can calculate at the same time that saves you computer time and then also we we use that model for european in a for european projects to do uh, operational uh, weather forecast over europe next slide so um, there are several predefined domains for that you can lose, that the model have been used. You see them here all over the world, but you can also, the user can fix its own domain. Next slide. Um, so the, the variables that the model expresses, these are meteorological variables, and then also gauge species, um, the, there are different mechanisms of different complexity. For example, we use uh, the, this SRPRC um, mechanism, which is uh, which have uh, which is well known. It has been developed in the US. We have a, a also a homemade mechanism which has only hundred reactions, which is quite reduced, uh, quite quick. Then, for particulate matter, we have, for example, inorganic species like sulfate, nitrate, ammonium. We have a uh, different organic and carbonaceous species. Uh, we have dust, sea salt, um, and then we have sulfate from, from DMS formation. So 
we have also a heterogeneous chemistry and aqueous chemistry uh, included in the model. Next slide. We have a we distribute this model is distributed at the website that you can see here, and we have uh, over two hundred users all over the world um, that you can see in this figure. So maybe you will become one of the new users of that model. Next slide, please. Um, and so now we'll, I'll come to some of the applications. So the, the first one is pollution forecast. Um, so here you see the a three day in advance pollution forecast for France, uh, which is done by the French Prévert system. Um, you see here the PM 2.5 map over France over the weekend. We had bright weather with uh, easterly winds, which brings polluted co uh, continental air masses to France with uh, uh, PM 2.5 concentrations, concentrations at about 30 microgram per cubic meter. That's quite high for France. And this is over the, over the WHO uh, limits. So that is one of the important applications that we have operationally for this model. Next slide. Another, so here, if you click on that, yeah, this is an uh, animation. So we we modeled, another application is to model the heat wave of France that occurred in summer 2022. On the left, you see the temperature fields and you see in the red color that uh, uh, air masses with a uh, yeah, high Saharan temperature were brought into, into Europe. And you see then at the right side, corresponding to that, we have a large buildup of bi bi secondary organic aerosol that forms because enhanced temperature means then enhanced emissions of these aerosol precursors like isoprene and terpenes. So here we see already a model application yeah, to distinguish different sources that including natural sources that can contribute to the, to the pollution. Next slide. Another application is uh, uh, from the work of uh, of Vaiguru Nyaga, who is a doctoral student at Lisa and who is um, at the meeting also, I think. And so his his uh, thesis subject is to work on the impact or to quantify the impact of anthropogenic and natural biogenic sources on fine particles over Eastern African mega cities. Um, I'm sorry for the for the fault here. This is the minus one version of the presentation, but it doesn't matter much. Um, all is in. And you see here something which is very typical for, for this type of modeling, that is the nested model setup. So what Waiguru did here is to have a to fix a course domain with a relative over whole Central and Eastern Africa with uh, uh, quite um, small, quite yeah, um, a quite uh, low re special resolution of 30 kilometers. And then as he focuses, for example, on Nairobi, he has a smaller grids with much refined um, horizontal resolution. So this is called grid nesting, and that's what is very, what is very useful. So I show you here results from the intermediate domain with six times six kilometer in the next slide. Um, so the first is here, if you look at the, at the, at the figure D with PM 2.5 diurnal pro profile, this is um, this is a model evaluation where where uh, Vaiguru compared the the, the diurnal variation for Nairobi um, over a year to the observations that he got from these low cost sensors, which are very useful to get PM 2.5 measurements, uh, especially if you have no reference instruments. Uh, so, but still, you need to calibrate them. At Nairobi, there were some reference instruments, but this is then uh, there were other places. So he he compared these two, and he saw for that case a relatively small bias and and quite some uh, good reproduction of the journal variations. So this is one of the one of the good sides. I showed you there are other other ones where the results are more more difficult or more diverging. Okay, but at least we had this is the only source of. Uh, validation that we had, and we we were already quite glad to 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 have these results. Next slide. Uh, so one question is how much do seasonal fires uh, impact the season, the regional distribution of this PM two point five? Um, so the fine particle concentrations on the left side. To do so, you can just let one of let 
compare two simulations on the left side without these fire missions, and on the right side without the fire, with including the fire missions, and then from the difference you get the importance of this of the source, and um, and you get, you see here that the, the colors are quite different. So for also yeah, either for Kenya and for Uganda, the the impact of the fire missions um, turns out to be very important, especially for the background emissions. And then you see the red, red blobs over the cities where the anthropogenic emissions is much more important than the fire emissions. Next slide. Next slide is then how to get involved in this in this type of modeling. So first thing you need is, you need is computer time resources. So if looking for a large domain here on the right, so, so this is some kind of maximum domain that you can have for this type of modeling um uh with a um with a 60 kilometer horizontal resolution one day uh, one day of simulation takes about six minutes um and a year would take about one month but then you can have a much better much better resolution than 60 kilometers but uh, this is for the case where we have 70 cores of uh, for parallel computing so for parallel computing with a computing center that is very good to have to, to run these models, they are cheaper than climate models. You can also use PC clusters. Um, and if you have a PC or a, or a Mac available, you can also do this modeling only for short time, for short, let's say one week simulations. There are different things to to do to limit computer time you can play on the domain extension on the horizontal resolution using this grid technique nestings you can take for example a simpler chemical scheme so you can you can go you can do some simulations even if you have uh, limited computer time next slide so uh Second thing is you need for this type of model, which is already quite complicated to put up, to put uh, to put into action, scientific and technical skills. So for that, we organize regular training sessions and workshops to learn how to work with this Shima model um, once per year. The other thing is to to have scientific collaborations with one of well with the with persons with users who know already how to work with these type of models through common projects or exchanges of young researchers. Next slide. And so uh, there's a developing team really working with this GMA model, developing it further. These are the persons here. Uh, that you, you see the photos. There's a, a overview publication that you can use to, uh, to learn more about this model and you my email to contact me if you have further questions. Thanks a lot. Great, thanks, Matthias. Uh, okay, so we've gone through a number of different uh, levels of complexity. Uh, and so now uh, Peter Adams will take us back through a different level. Uh, go ahead, Peter, whenever you're ready. Okay, thanks, Mike. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about a class of models called reduced complexity models or RCMs uh, for air quality. And then the subtitle here is nimble tools for policy assessment. Nimble tools meaning a lot easier to run. So you heard uh, about the complexity of the GCMs and the CTMs, uh, which are great models. And I've done lots of work uh, with both kinds of models. Um, however, um, uh, this is uh, this. What I'm going to talk about here is based on the recognition that for policy assessment, for decision making, and also for kind of resource constrained developing countries, it may make sense to have an alternative um, that's that's sort of easier to access. So let me talk about that. RCMs are a new, new-ish class of tools, um, and so very much emerging. Uh, uh, so let me talk about it. Um, so reduced complexity models are really motivated by the idea that um, 
For example, in my country, the United States, when the US Environmental Protection Agency wants to evaluate a policy, they run a chemical transport model typically. Um, for many countries around the world that don't have chemical transport modeling capabilities as part of their government civil service, that's not practical. And so we wanted so we wanted an alternative that would be a much easier point of entrance, uh, especially given the big uh, development decisions, the high pollutant concentrations and the large number of people affected. So you saw this picture already. Um, but uh, I want to draw your uh, attention here. As we move away from scientific applications to informing government decision makers and policy makers, it becomes more and more important to make the models accessible and easy to use, low computation requirements. Uh, the RC and RCM stands for reduced complexity. So they do not, they're not as fancy or sophisticated as the models you just heard about. Um, however, I will show you a little bit later that we've worked very hard to calibrate and evaluate the models. Uh, and I feel confident that they are almost as good as chemical transport models and definitely suitable for uh, many kinds of applications. So um, this kind of schematic is an introduction to how a policymaker might think about uh, evaluating a policy. So up here on the top, you'll have the, your baseline emissions that represents what's happening right now, present day. Um, then you'll have a new emission scenario. For example, if a policy is implemented and emissions are reduced, that would be here. You can use any kind of air quality model to do a simulation and to get a change in the pollutant concentration. For example, PM 2.5, if you know something about epidemiology, there's something called the concentration response relationship that relates the PM concentration to, to health, to a change in mortality. And that mortality rate here, and if you combine that with the number of people living in different places, you can combine the concentrations, mortality rates, and the number of people to evaluate a health outcome, an increase or hopefully a decrease in the number of premature deaths associated with air pollution. Um, and this last step is maybe not so important, but economists who like to do benefit cost analysis might use something like a value of statistical life to, to convert that into a, a monetary value. So typically this air quality simulation is done with chemical transport models. Uh, that is the most time consuming step and so our idea was to replace it with something much simpler. Um, when you get down to the bottom here, I just wanna introduce the idea uh, for PM 2.5, the major health endpoint that we're mostly thinking about is the number of premature deaths or mortalities. And then you can think about that, um, the number of mortalities caused by each ton of emission. So that's a, a metric that tells you how bad uh, uh, emitting something is. If you know about global warming potential, it's a little like that, except for uh, it matters where the emissions happen because it matters how many people are nearby and exposed. So when I, I talk to people about reduced complexity models, uh, there's often confusion because it's a new area and also because reduced complexity models are actually really kind of an approach that includes three different things. So on the left-hand slide of the side, sl uh, left-hand side of the slide, for the RCM developers, there's the reduced complexity model itself. There's actually four or five different RCMs out there. They're all a little bit different, so it's hard to generalize about what that is. For this audience, I think most people are not developing the models, but want to use the model. So on the right-hand side, um, although you can use the model itself, most people try to interact with some of the output of the models in the form of one or two things. One thing is marginal damages. And another thing that the RCMs give you is something called a source receptor matrix. So I will talk about um, 
each one of those on, on the coming slide. So I'll just leave it there for now. So marginal damages, this is a, a metric that tells you how bad emitting one ton of a pollutant is. So if you think about, again, the number of premature mortalities caused by emitting one ton of a pollutant, either primary PM 2.5 or a precursor like SO2, you can think about this metric mortalities per ton of emission. So that's what we mean by marginal damage. If you, if you add or subtract one tiny unit of emission, uh, what are the health consequences? So this just gives you uh, an example of what that looks like using a reduced complexity model that we call REACH uh, the, in collaboration with Professor Rebecca Garland at the University of Pretoria. What this, so this is 10 countries in the southern part of Africa. Um, and the map shows you, um, uh, I want to emphasize this, usually when we look at maps, we're used to seeing emissions or concentrations. This is showing you something different. It shows you the marginal damages. So the mortalities caused, in this case, per 1,000 per kiloton of emissions. And so it's not concentrations. It tells you how bad it is to emit, in this case, sulfur dioxide from a certain location. Down here, this kind of bright yellowish color where I'm directing my cursor, that's the Hautang region of South Africa. Uh, where Johannesburg, Pretoria are, you can see it's the one of the most densely populated areas of this region. And so you can see that's where the damages are highest simply. So it's it's especially bad to emit SO2 there uh, because of the, it forms PM that a lot of people will be exposed to. So that's what the marginal damages give you. And then in comparison in the darker colors, um, there are fewer people. So the health effects of emitting a ton of pollution there are less. And so how you use this model, and we really tried our, our hardest to make it e you know, very easy for the user, is um, this is something, in fact, that can be done uh, with a spreadsheet in maybe an hour or two. The hard part is coming up with the emissions scenario or the emissions change. Uh, but once you have the emissions, uh, calculating the health impacts with the marginal damages that the RCM gives to the user is really easy because for each unit of emission E or emission change delta E, you just multiply by the marginal damages. So uh, if the, let me just go back, if uh, you know the uh, damage here in the yellow is something like 20 mortalities per thousand tons, and then you multiply by the number of tons of SO2 that you're changing, you can say what the change in mortality is. And since you have that for a lot of different species, primary PM 2.5, SO2, NOx, and so on, and all the locations that you saw on the map before, you can actually do that multiplication, um, you know, even thousands of times for a scenario and come up with the change in mortality. Um, but you can do that in a spreadsheet. So that's a very simple application. It just converts an emissions change into um, uh, a total health effect. If you want to actually produce maps of concentrations or concentration changes, uh, you use something different that the RCMs give you, which is called the source receptor matrix. So it is in fact a, a matrix in the sense of linear algebra. It's a, a, a table of data. And what the source receptor matrix lets you do is map uh, an emission scenario into PM 2.5 concentrations. So imagine, I'll go back to the map again. Uh, imagine yeah, that you have, imagine that, can we, uh, if there's a question that's great or otherwise if we can mute, uh, I'm just getting a little background noise. Um, so if you have emissions in, of, in each one of those locations, you just list those emissions in the form of a vector. And then the source receptor matrix lets you map that emissions vector into a corresponding vector of PM 2.5 concentration changes. So basically it's just doing a matrix vector multiplication 
and it gives you the change in PM 2.5 associated with the change uh, of emission. Uh, and there, so you'd have a source receptor matrix for primary PM, for SO2, for NOx, for VOCs, for ammonia, and so on. Um, and so this is where uh, we really try to lower the barrier of entry to help people do um, simple modeling. And so the marginal damages, because you're really just multiplying two numbers over and over again, you can do that in a spreadsheet. The source receptor matrix uh, is a little more complicated. Um, uh, you want to have some kind of programming environment. Almost any kind of programming environment will work. So if you like to program in R or Python or even MATLAB, all these would work fine, others as well. And the hard part, again, uh, is, is thinking about what the emissions are and what the emissions changes are. Uh, the, the air pollution has been made uh, much simpler here. So um, because they reduce complexity, of course, we want to make them as good as possible. I don't have a lot of time, but we've spent a lot of work trying to make sure that the RCMs, uh, they will probably never be as good as a chemical transport model, but nearly as good. Um, and so there's evaluation of each RCM in its development papers. We have this paper here by Elizabeth Gilmore for the United States that have compared three RCMs against each other. And we feel like they are giving reasonable results that agree with each other. And then I have a paper that will be coming out from a student that shows that we can use uh, RCMs to predict long-term changes in USPM 2.5 almost as well as a chemical transport model. So I, I'm happy to share those in more detail, but in the interest of time, I won't. Um, there's also some question about how good an RCM has to be to be good enough. I, I This is a, a discussion that I think takes a lot of time. So I'm, I'm gonna leave it here. I assume the slides will be available. I'm happy to do it in the Q&A or offline with anybody. But again, I feel like the RCMs have achieved sufficiently good accuracy compared to CC CTMs that they're very usable for decision making. Here I've listed what some of the major reduced complexity models are. I've listed five. You can see the first, there's a lot of activity here at my university, Carnegie Mellon University, where three of them, APEEP, REACH, and EASIER have been developed, either in my group or by Professor Muller, my colleague. There's also InMap and GAINS out of University of Illinois in Yasa. Each of the bullets describes a little bit about how the RCMs operate. They're all different, and so, um, but I don't think that's too relevant right here. Um, let me give a little bit of status. Uh, I've started to do a lot of work to bring these reduced complexity models from the United States, where we first developed them, to um, I'm working with collaborators in uh, both India and Africa. You saw already the, the REACH South Africa RCM, which is complete. If you live in any of the, the 10 countries in the, the region and you're interested, send me an email. We're happy to share that model with you. We're starting another uh, reduced complexity model uh, for, for the Southern African region. We're starting work on East Africa and we are very early starting work on West Africa, we're also contemplating something for all of Africa. This is all very much in development, so I'm happy to talk with you. Um, what I wanna conclude with is that chemical transport models and reduced complexity models are really um, different but complementary tools. For the most part, chemical transport models, if you're really in the gory details of doing scientific research, that's what you want. Uh, if you're thinking about trends or changes to support decision-making and policy-making, an RCM gives you a much easier entry point. Um, and then there's a lot of benchmarking that we do between the RCMs and the CTMs to make sure the RCMs are good enough. So to wrap up, uh, we've done, we've built a lot of these reduced complexity models. We've been very careful in evaluating them. They let you do air pollution uh, modeling in really very limited amount of time and very limited uh, computing resources, spreadsheet and doing you know a little bit of programming. That makes science-based decision-making possible with these reduced complexity models. 
And I've left my email here in the slides because uh, if you're in Africa and you want to learn more about what we're doing, um, I'm happy to, to hear from you and, and talk more. That's my last slide. So I will turn it back over to Mike. Thank you very much. It's It's been a pleasure. Great, thanks, Peter. Uh, okay, so those were all of the uh, presentations that we had scheduled uh, and we have some time for any questions and answers. Um, if you do have a question, just go ahead and uh, use the little hand tool uh, and we will unmute and you can ask a question directly. Uh, alternatively, you can also uh, put them in the chat. Um, and I actually just wanted to start while we're, while we're waiting for this. Uh, so specifically to, to Dan and, and Matthias, um, you know, Peter just talked a lot about what the sort of uh, learning curve of those models uh, of the RCMs are. Can you guys talk about the learning curves and how much uh, time and effort it takes to, to run uh, the, the CTMs, the GCMs, and the dispersions? You want me to go first, Matthias? No. Sure. Okay. Uh, um, okay. Go. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. Sure. I'll go. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, air mod or dispersion models in general don't require all that much learning curve. I would say. Um, I had I put some information in the chat about do, being able to do some self guided uh, exercises where you can run the code, you can download the code, uh, you can um, you know run some basic scenarios. Um, so that, I think that could be learned in, you know, a matter of a week or something at most. Um, the learning curve on the GCMs, on the other hand, is quite intense, I would say. I mean, that's, that's something that you kind of spend an entire PhD on. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's not something that you can really, you know, just sort of pick up overnight. Yeah, Matthias? Okay, so for for the CGMs, it's more like the it's more like the climate models, but it's uh, maybe a bit easier. Um, so I, I think either you have already um, a group of persons who is who has good computer skills and who has already used uh, some of the let's for example say a Gaussian model or dispersion model, and then you then you do the, the formation with the with the CGM. Um, and then, then you could, you could do it or, or you, or, or you send a PhD to, to, to then to, to, a, to a group doing this type of modeling or a postdoc, uh, and, and he will, or she will learn it over time. So either you have already good skills and you can learn it or, or if you're, kind of beginner and more working on, on experimental work right now, then then it's better to have a, a collaboration with exchange of, 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 of persons that you, yeah, for capacity building and for learning. Great. Uh, there's a slight follow-up question for you, Matthias. Uh, are the trainings for Shimer online or on-site? Uh, they have been online during COVID. They are now on-site. Um, so, because there is really practical work to be done, as Rose, for example, asked in the, in the chat. So, so you you get you get some you you do some simulations on the on the local computer there, and that is much easier online. Um, uh, so, sorry, on site, on site. So, if there's some big interest, maybe maybe the organization could also accept a hybrid mode. So, try try asking. <laughs> Okay, so it sounds like uh, there there may be some if if the participants in this in this webinar uh, decide to get together and send a mass email, maybe yeah, <laughs> get a, a nice online uh, setup going. Um, yeah, anyone anyone with any questions in the chat, feel free to uh, you know raise your hand if you'd like to ask it in person, or uh, there's some more coming in. Um, yeah, Matthias, is, is it possible for Shimer to be implemented on a personal PC? Yeah, it's it's it it is possible, but it's uh, then the the what you can do with it is is limited 
in time you can have weak simulation and you and this is this could be still interesting for if you have a intensive campaign and you want to more understand what what you measured during that campaign so i think there that could be a scientific application then for the policy applications um that you you would need more year round simulations probably and that and that you can't do with a pc so I'll chime in there. I mean, that that's the kind of, if you want an annual average PM 2.5, for example, and, and you don't have a lot of computer power, that's the natural kind of use case application case for the RCM. Um, I, I wanted to sort of just raise up out of the chat. There's a lot of questions in the chat about emissions. And um, I don't know, Mike and Dan, uh, you know, emission seems like a ripe topic for a training. Um, uh, I said in my you know intro that emissions are often the limiting factor. I, I say that for the United States, and um, uh, if anything, the emissions are more challenging in Africa. But I'll, I'll just reiterate what I said in the chat, which is, um, I mean, I think we should always be willing to use the best emissions that we have. And so I mentioned in the chat, there is the Dakiwa emissions inventory, which covers all of Africa, wow. which has Africa specific data. We've also used the Edgar inventories. The Edgar, I mean, they're global, they're not very Africa specific, um, but they give okay-ish starting point results. And so I just want to, uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with this saying, uh, at least in the English speaking world, we have this saying, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, which means, you know, don't don't try it for the perfect emissions inventories that will never be perfect. And even, I mean, don't even let the good be the enemy of the okay, I guess. It's like sometimes okay is the best you can do. Um, air quality modeling is in fact a way to understand and improve emissions inventories. So it's always, you know, okay to start with whatever emission inventory you have see what you get and then try to refine in an iterative way that will help you see what what's missing and what are the weaknesses of the emission inventory by doing that modeling so um, modeling even with emissions inventories that are so so can be a very educational and informative thing to do yeah no thanks for pointing that out uh we have a question by elisa fame Go ahead and ask it. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I am Ekzefane Rankonda. I am Orisa Chatiba Beshboyal in Romania. I did the, my PhD was about the air quality modeling, where I used the dispersion models, especially uh, that IROMOD and ICS, TS3 industrial complex. Uh, most of the challenge I faced with when I was doing my research, I did the uh, about the modeling of uh, transport routes and uh, street road network. But most of the challenge I've been faced with the quantification of uh, emission rates. So my question was concerned about Matthias, what he, he, the, he shared another model, which is good. And I'm interested in that model for uh, my postdoc, and also for that uh, regression for uh, Adams about the scenarios of quantification uh, with, uh, for decision makers. So actually, uh, that was which was I was thinking, and I was lacking in the air quality modeling. So somehow can make decision maker how those quantification of mortality like those domain for using different model and comparison. So I was wondering whether this model of Matthias has uh, some the quantification of emission rate. If you have some way of quantification emission rate, that's number one. And for also Adams, I want to know whether uh, those decision maker there is somehow we can collaborate with the authorities, let's say, uh, for political issues somehow, and the social side of the population. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. To answer your your first question, so the the emissions. This is really some information which is outside of the model, which you need to bring to the model, which you need to give to the model. That is what uh, Peter said just before, and and 
And then also, uh, this is for all type of metal models, this is the case that you that you need an emission inventory. So as Peter said before, there are um, available emission inventories that you that you can use for that. They are in the in the they are at global regional scale. Um, so, but you can start with that if you want to have more something more better for your city. Then you you can you can work with your city administration and get additional input ta data from them. For example, you can you can get information about traffic, about about residential emissions. So, but this is something that you need to give to the model. The model does not know the emissions themselves. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I guess, I guess the other part of your question on this, Fana, is um, about sort of interacting with government decision makers. And so um, uh, that, that's a big and complex question. I, I think, you know, where we are right now in, in the way I'm thinking about sort of my work with African collaborators is that I, I you know, I hope that the scientists and the academics become kind of the depository of the, the knowledge, right? What kinds of models exist, how to use them, what are their strengths and weaknesses? And then from, from there, from the scientific university academic community, that they're talking to the policymakers in each one of their countries. And I know that's much easier said than done, but those are kind of the steps that I see is sort of building the the scientific and technical capacity in the science and academic world and then and then pushing it but it is nice that we have these different tools you know the more sophisticated comprehensive ctms and then the reduced complexity models so that you you have your choice depending on what you need to do yeah thank you so much actually that's what the challenge i was having when i was exposing my views at, at the national i'm from rwanda in kigari so oh, okay yeah, so uh, that's what the challenge I was facing. But we look forward to communicating with you for further for my future projection. Thank you so much. Great, thanks so much for the, the question. Um, are there any others in, in chat or? Uh, sure, Ab Abdelaziz, go ahead. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Mike. Michael, for this uh, webinar, my question is this. Uh, I understood from uh, your lectures that uh, we need a lot of data in order to implement it in the model. Uh, for example, we need a lot of air stations, etc. What if we don't have a, a lot of air stations? We have only one, one air station. How can we use the data of only one to model or to predict uh, uh, the air quality of a, a big surface like a, a country in in like a country thank you is my question clear yeah i think so uh i think probably all three speakers can go ahead and chime in on that i mean i'll um um I'll take one crack and others can add to it. So um, if you're using one of the models like a GCM that does the meteorology, um, then then you don't need to provide uh, really, I mean, there's some boundary conditions and things, but basically you don't need to provide station data. I think the station data uh, probably showed up on the AirMod slide. Uh, I believe there are ways to run AirMod with modeled meteorological data as opposed to station data. Um, uh, the other things that are available, so there's something called reanalysis data sets. Um, they're usually global data sets where someone has run a global, a global meteorological or climate model for a historical time period. And so then you have gridded meteorological data like every hour, or every six hours um, on some kind of grid. Uh, and it takes a bit of data processing, but those uh, reanalysis data fields are usually the meteorological data that will go into a CTM, for example. 
Uh, and with the reduced complexity models that we've been building, uh, in particular on the the one that we've tried to make the easiest to use is something called the reach model. And that has an interface to, to um, uh, pull um, uh, the era of uh, global reanalysis data and, and take the data for the region of interest. So um, if, you, if you lack observations, it's, it's really the reanalysis data that, that helps you out. Okay, thank you for answering. Yeah, maybe just just to make it to make it clear that is the 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 measurements of the air pollutants are not required as input for the model. They are they are there to be to evaluate these models that they are that they are correct. So if you have some sites for different places in the country of different types, let's say a city side and then an urban side or a rural side or yeah. Uh, then this is already not too bad. And the model gives you the additional in information then of, of pollutant concentrations where you don't have where you don't have measurements. Sure, they are not as they have in inherent uncertainties, they are not as certain as as the measurements them themselves. Uh, okay, thank you. I have also another question. Uh, I am a PhD student, and uh, uh, I would like to do something relevant in my thesis. I am from Morocco, and uh, what type of uh, uh, how do how will I orient my thesis? How where do I, where would I orient my thesis in order to do something relevant, something of uh, high quality research? Like, uh, what should I study, and what uh, should I apply? I think that's uh, that's a bit up to you. I would say I don't know that any of us can necessarily direct uh, an individual's thesis, um, but yeah, I mean, I think the a lot of the modeling concepts that we presented today um, are not sort of widely done in Africa. I think you know Peter, with the exception, you know Peter showed some stuff, and and Shimer has also been applied to Africa as. Um, as Matthias had, had mentioned, but um, com co relatively speaking, comparing the modeling activities that happen, for example, in Europe or in North America, uh, there's not a lot uh, relatively compared into uh, into Africa. So I think that it is a a pretty good field to uh, to be in. Thank you for uh, your answer. I appreciate it. All right, great. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, we've had about uh, 25 minutes of questions. Uh, sure, we can take one or two more. Um, Sammy, Joel, Panwa, go ahead. All right. Um, uh, um, my name is Sammy Joel Panwa. So um, I'm from Nigeria. Most of the way we interpret the air quality data in Nigeria are using just descriptive statistics and maybe some kind of any kind of statistical analysis. So modeling air quality data is very important. In fact, that was why I was able to join the, the webinar. So I will really be glad if similar events will be reorganized so that at least I can be able to like model where well, I have a lot of data that we have collected from air um, pollution and the rest of them. But to be able to do analysis, model it, get findings, share with policymakers and other people around to make informed decision, it's a difficult situation. It's just an appeal that if similar um, webinars are done, maybe with a very practical analysis being done with the software, it will help some of us to gain the knowledge where we'll be able to like conduct um, similar modelings and then be able to share insight with policymakers and other people. Thank you.
Um, okay, yeah, sure. Um, thank you for, for the comment. Um, yeah, uh, so if there's no other um, questions, or or maybe uh, Sammy, if you had a specific question that you wanted to rephrase for for someone. No. Okay. Um, no. 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 <laughs> okay. Um, great. Um, all right. Uh, anyone have any closing thoughts, comments? Uh, if not, thank you, everyone, for. Well Hello, Mike. Oh, sure. Hi. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Mike, um, Matthias, Dan, and Peter. This is something that I've been looking out for, and especially for my students, PhD students. Uh, three of them are here. And um, for the models, the interest of the students are right now not um, as developers, but as users. So they need to know how to make use of um, the different models. For instance, um, this one of my students that is looking at um, um, transport as source of um, pollution emissions, especially in uh, the city of Lagos. And so that's what he's looking at. He's trying to study, looking at a particular um, important um, road that um, uh, we experience a lot of um, vehicular emissions. So, and he needs the particular model that will help him to do that, spatially and also uh, temporarily. So um, this is a very good opportunity for him and for us, and uh, I thank you very much and um, want to continue, I think offline, you will also uh, see how it gets trained and the other um, students also from this, they'll be able to know what's actually, uh, which area to actually um, um, link um, their, their research to as far as modeling is concerned. Thank you so much. That's my comment. Great, thanks, Rose. Allow, uh, me. Allow me, hello. Yeah, hello. All right, yes, sorry, last... sorry. Okay, this Just will be the last one, go ahead. go ahead. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I've been observing uh, the presentations. I'm not from air quality monitoring, but electrical engineering with a, a PhD in uh, artificial intelligence. And I'm looking at the big data. You see air quality is big data. So I expected uh, a lot of, uh, maybe in the model, in the model design and all this, I don't know whether there is an incorporation of uh, AI in it. So I don't know how, how, how it's developed, what, what kind of, uh, uh, techniques are you using uh, for projection? Because you see, we train, we have some data, we train, and then you have talked about 100 years to come, 50 years to come. Are there AI in it? Maybe uh, Prof. Peter, you can, you, can, you can respond to that. Yeah, I mean, that's a big question that we could talk a long time about. Uh, I think the simple answer is all the models that we talked about here, are basically more or less free of AI. Uh, that is, they are physics-based uh, models that you know use physical equations, mass balances, conservation of mass, rates of chemical processes, and so on. Um, so, on, at the same time, I mean, I think probably most there's a lot of interest in in how we try to blend AI with observations or with the physics models. That's a very new and cutting edge, edge research area um, that, um, again, we could, we could probably talk for an hour about. But it, this is most, I, I think the other thing that's sort of important to emphasize about these models, because they are physics-based, of course, with most AI um, techniques, 
uh, it's it's often about you know the training data that you have and that the model does very well within the training data space. But a lot of times we want to ask questions about extrapolation. What if we're going into a totally new space, either because of climate change or because we're reducing emissions or increasing emissions to very different levels that are what are in the historical training data. So there's there's power in the physical models, there's power in the AI models. There are ways to try to blend them, but that's, that's a really hard and cutting edge problem that is probably a topic for another time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, so thank you again. This was a great couple of questions right at the end there that were really great. Um, so just as a reminder, uh, the recording of this will be uh, put on YouTube uh, probably within the next couple of days. Um, if you would like, uh, we will go ahead and uh, can continue some of the discussion there. You can leave some uh, questions and comments and hopefully we'll get uh, some of the speakers here and some other experts. Uh, I, I see Emma Nolan is, is here, uh, can chime in on, on some of those things as well. Um, Additionally, uh, we will also be uh, subtitling this video in at least French uh, and potentially some other languages. Uh, if you would like to volunteer your time for another language uh, to subtitle this video in on YouTube, um, please contact me directly. I'd, we'd, we'd love to love to chat with you about that. Um, and otherwise, uh, yeah, so thanks so much. Uh, it's been great. Um, the next webinar will be sometime in the new year. Um, we'll kind of discuss internally what it will be about, um, but we hope to see you then too. So yeah, thank you everyone for joining. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, bye. Thank you so much. Mike, thanks a lot for organizing. This is fun. Yeah. All right, thanks Mike.